All right, so I'm reading in a public place right now. So uh, maybe you'll hear some people yelling or screaming or something like that. Uh, or like a lawnmower. I hear a lawnmower in the distance. So hopefully this recording won't be terrible. But if it is terrible, then um, I beg your forgiveness. Um, and thank you for bearing uh, with me. Um, I'm back at school on campus. Uh, this essay is called The Bureaucracy After the Death of Stalin, and it's by Cornelius Castoriadis. The changes that have taken place in the USSR and its satellite countries since Stalin's death are important both in themselves, as a gallon, and, and for an understanding of the bureaucratic regime. By posing the formidable problem of who should succeed him, the death of the personage who had been for the past 25 years both the undisputed incarnation of the power of the Russian bureaucracy and the despot dreaded and hated by his own class necessarily had to cause a stir within ruling circles and ran the risk of touching off interclick struggles that had been held in check till that point by the absolute power of a single person. In itself, however, his death was not sufficient to determine any changes in domestic and foreign policy. If such changes have come, it is the objective situation in Russia and its satellite countries that has necessitated them more and more. Stalin's death undoubtedly helped them along, for the singular individual who had incarnated the previous orientation has now disappeared, and the process of petrification of groups and policies that had accompanied the last years of his reign has now been halted. Undoubtedly, too, this death must have accentuated these changes and compressed them in time. Insofar as the new leadership team tries to draw from it all the advantages that might promote its consolidation of power. We hardly need recall how the events of the last six months have confirmed the class character of the Russian regime, of which Stalin's personal power was the expression and in no way the foundation. Reactionary journalists are at it once again that are at it once again with their, quote, Red Czar, end quote. The struggles of the Diodicus, Diodicus, D-I-A-D-O-C-H-I-S, around the succession of Stalin might, if they became extremely violent, promote the explosion of a working class revolution in Russia, but this is an extremely unlikely prospect right now. By themselves, these struggles could never lead to the collapse of a regime representing 20 to 30 million privileged oppressive bureaucrats. Changes in the USSR. Let us recall the most significant measure taken since Stalin's death. They all seem to go in the same direction. A softening of the dictatorship, one. Amnesty, two. An end to the doctor's conspiracy, three lowered prices, and for the purge of the Ukrainian Communist Party. As for the amnesty, we cannot determine its extent from the text authorizing it, for we need to know both the numbers of persons in prison and the manner in which it will be administered. Nonetheless, it is likely that this amnesty is appreciably broader than all previous ones. We must note that it excludes political offenses, what are called, quote, counter-revolutionary, end quote, crimes, meriting sentences of more than five years. But we should also point out that this type of offense can be interpreted in a number of ways. It is not out of the question for political offenses to be dealt with, with, dealt with under common law, and in this sense they will benefit from the amnesty all the same. But it is likely that confusions of, about such offenses will operate in the opposite direction too, for numerous, quote, economic, end quote, mistakes that ought in principle to, be, principle to be erased might have been or can be considered counter-revolutionary. Is the worker who has been sentenced for having, quote, sabotaged, end quote, production, damaged work materials, or refused to follow orders and a, quote, economic, end quote, criminal? or a, a counter-revolutionary. This equivocation appears quite clearly in the proviso thrown in about thefts of state property, which can cover very different offenses and by itself should restrict the category of amnesties for economic crimes. Finally, it is not out of the question that Article 8, which allows for criminal penalties to be replaced with disciplinary sanctions in the case of an economic offense,
will make it possible to ease the administrative system of rule in the factories. On the whole, quote, common law offenders, end quote, surely will be affected by this amnesty, but its effect upon other categories of detainees cannot be estimated. The state of ignorance in which we find ourselves can be measured by the differences in interpretation in which we find our the ignorance of the state of ignorance in which we find ourselves can be measured by the differences in interpretation to which these measures have given rise while le monde assumes that they will affect at most at the most a few thousand or dozens of thousands of persons the economist talks of many hundreds of thousands and les observateurs alexander verth or alexander vert w e r t h of at least one and a half million people. The rehabilitation of the doctors arrested at the end of Stalin's reign and the measures accompanying this action have a more precise meaning, thereby leading us to admit that the amnesty has a certain value. For a conspiracy charge to be set aside in judicial, quote, errors, end quote, to be denounced explicitly is in itself unprecedented. Furthermore, the large-scale publicity given to this event indicates the leadership's desire to affirm that a radical change has taken place in domestic policy. The leadership has seized the occasion to officially condemn racial discrimination and to proclaim the rights of citizens as guaranteed in principle by the Constitution. The Pravda article announcing the doctor's rehabilitation insists too strongly on the respect for legality that should animate public life in the USSR and the rights of particular strata of the population, kolkhozniki, and intellectuals, for this action to be simply a matter of ritual demagogy. Moreover, the setting aside of the conspiracy charge has been accompanied by a purge of the Ministry of Security, which, if it, if it corresponds to a settlement of the struggle between cliques, also should show the public the limitations placed on the power of the police. One second. This was originally published in 1953 in Socialisme ou Barbarie. Anyway, an anxious return. An anxiousness to return to more flexible methods of dictatorship is apparent in the way another issue has been handled. The purge of the Ukrainian Communist Party and the removal of its first secretary, Melnikov. Excuse me, no, Melnikov, M-E-L-N-I-K-O-V, has been accompanied by criticism of the way he applied national and cultural policy. The leadership of the Ukrainian party is reproached for having subjected the country to Russian domination by placing individuals from other regions in all key posts and by trying to impose upon it Russian culture and language. The same misfortune just came down on the leadership of the Lithuanian party. Finally, arising in this climate of detente, the lowering of prices is also a sign of the government's new preoccupations. This drop certainly was not the first, but rather the sixth. Nevertheless, it is more extensive than the preceding drops. The prices of a whole series of necessities have been lowered by 10 to 15 percent. Price reductions each reach 40 percent for vegetables, 50 percent for potatoes, 60 percent for fruits. At the same time, a vast campaign to benefit the people's welfare, to construct workers' housing, and to improve consumption occupies the front pages of Izvestia. These measures have gone hand to in hand with upheavals in ruling circles. This is an expression of the struggle between bureaucratic cliques triggered by Stalin's death. During an initial phase, this struggle already manifested in the previously mentioned purges of national communist parties was to remain indecisive and had to end in a temporary compromise. This is shown first by the Ignatiev affair. Ignatiev, who was removed for having hatched the fake doctor's conspiracy, was Minister of State Security. Till March 7th, the date his ministry was attached to the Ministry of the Interior, held by Berea, 
he had been designated on March 6th as one of the three of one of three new secretaries and on March 14th when the exact composition of the secretariat was announced as one of its five members. That is to say, the decision to eliminate him was not made immediately after Stalin's death and probably was the object of a deal among the new leaders. Therefore, there was an initial uncertain phase of negotiations culminating in a division of responsibilities among the new leaders. This idea is confirmed by many facts. First, there was the recovery of key po posts, interior, the army, and foreign affairs, by three men who had seen themselves removed from real control five years before, Beria, Buganin, and Molotov. Then, the Politburo was reconstituted with former members like Mikoyan, Kaganovich, and Virashilov at the sides of the aforementioned three men and Melenkov. The reconstitution of the Politburo is particularly significant. It has been replaced last autumn by a presidium of 36 members clearly favorable to Melenkov. Since the latter directed the unit charged with making nominations to the Central Committee and therefore could count on men loyal to the presidium, now this large organ where the authority of former Politburo members could easily be scaled down, was suppressed immediately upon Stalin's death. While it had been created by the Party Congress, the Central Committee was not given the opportunity to decide whether it should be abolished. This phase came to a close with the arrest of Berea, who was accused of being a foreign imperialist agent. It is still hard to know whether this elimination of, quote, number two, end quote, is merely a decisive episode in Milenkov's ascent toward a Stalinist type of absolute personal power, or whether it expresses something more, namely a political struggle between two bureaucratic factions, and to this extent whether it is calling back into question changes that have taken place, or whether it is changing their per practical perspective, excuse me, their practical effect. Several indications tend to make us think that the second interpretation is the more plausible one. Belenkov was very closely associated with the state leadership during the final phase of Stalin's reign. Whereas Berea was kept in the background, we therefore might be able to establish a connection between the latter's return and the policy changes that have occurred since March. Likewise, the character of the accusations brought against Berea as opposed to those brought in March against Ignatiev, who was accused at the time of incompetency, is vintage Stalinism and reintroduces straight away the atmosphere of the years of the Great Trials, even though this arrest allegedly is directed against the excessive powers of the police. And Pravda's respect excuse me, and Pravda's repeated affirmations of the preeminence of collective leadership and the pernicious character of personal power recall too vividly the proclamations Stalin made, so long as he himself had not yet become a person, for us to attach any great importance to them. We must recall, nevertheless, that in a bureaucratic regime, a leader and his fate are not tied to a policy or its success. And that Melenkov very might shoot Berea and then apply his policies. It's hot out here. Shoes got to come off. The real question does not involve writing a novel about the bureaucratic leadership, but rather is about seeking the motives that underlie the antagonisms among leadership groups and the present transformation of domestic policy. Before answering this question, we must set aside any simplistic interpretation that would fail to take into account the bureaucratic class's stability and would make one faction of the bureaucracy or another the representative of the interest of another class, the proletariat or the peasantry. Through their resistance to exploitation, the proletariat, like the peasantry, may well pose problems for the government and in this way give rise to disagreements about among groups of bureaucrats over the most effective leadership methods to be employed, but only indirectly do they influence state policy, which always represents the interests of the dominant stratum. Political differences can be interpreted only within the framework of the bureaucracy, but this statement does not necessarily signify that we must search for the source of these variations in the opposition between distinct social strata of the bureaucracy. This search, which for years has sat, excuse me, has satisfied the imagination of former Mensheviks employed by the bourgeois press, is based upon a confusion between the bourgeoisie and the bureaucracy.
between the classical mode of capitalist exploitation and collective planned capitalism. Whereas it is meaningful in the first case to relate, for example, a certain policy to distinct industrial groups, the sector of light industry being able to be more interested in granting concessions to the proletariat than the sector of heavy industry, or in conducting a conciliatory diplomatic strategy in some particular part of the world in order to preserve its particular markets. It is more than doubtful that such a relation could be established in a society where competition cannot be expressed on the economic level. A social group such as technicians or factory directors may very well possess certain characteristics that set them apart from the army. For example, but these common characteristics that are based on the similarity of their functions do not overlap with a clearly defined economic interest that could be represented in a national or international policy. Competition between bureaucrats, which exist here just as necessarily as it does in every other exploitative class, most likely follows more along the lines of local association and personal rivalries rather than along the lines of the objective structure of the system of production. In short, it is a struggle of cliques, not a rivalry between clearly constituted social strata seeking to appropriate for themselves a larger part of the surplus value that has been snatched from the hands of the proletariat. This evaluation of the bureaucracy allows us to reject the fantastic hypotheses about a struggle that is supposed to have taken place between the party, the army, the police, the administration, the administrators and technicians, and about an allegedly reallocated reallocation of power between the party, Malenkov, the police, Berea, and the army, Bulganin. Indeed, the party obviously does not constitute a distinct group, but is represented, rather, in all social sectors. Where were one to claim that the party membership of generals and factory directors does not give them any real power, that would signify precisely that the line of demarcation is to be drawn not horizontally between these allegedly adversarial groups, but vertically, between the middle and upper levels of the bureaucracy, the latter being torn only by a conflict among cliques, and not because it reproduces the differences among entire strata of society. No matter how the situation turns out, the hypothesis proves particularly fragile when it is applied to the latest changes in the state leadership. How can one speak, as, one, as was done in the past, of a victory of, for the army, or a return of the generals, when the army's representative in the secretariat is Bulganin? or Bulganin, who always was considered by the military an outsider, delegated by the party to watch over them. And at the same time, a certain number of small but significant facts point in the opposite direction, the absence of the generals from the official tribune during the May Day Review, the replacement of military people by civilians in key diplomatic posts in Austria and Germany. How, on the other hand, can one insist on a victory for the police when this victory, if it exists, is acquired at the cost of a large purge in the security services, beginning with that of its minister, Ignatiev, and even as the amnesty and the proclamation of individual rights tend to diminish its hold on society? And how, again, can the <coughs> recent annihilation of Berea be interpreted within this framework. The main thing, after all, is not to know the details of the personality struggles and inter clique rivalries that Stalin's death had brought into broad daylight, but to appraise correctly the important import of the domestic changes that have occurred and to understand their causes. Till now, these changes appear to be going in the direction of a softening of the dictatorship. We must add immediately to this idea two details that limit its import tremendously. First, the extent to which this softening actually is being put into effect is not known. There is nothing to keep us from thinking that in reality it amounts to very little. And second, whether it will be will also will last also excuse me. First, the extent to which this softening actually is being put into effect is not known. There is nothing to keep us from thinking that in reality it amounts to very little. And second, whether it will last also is not known. The Berea affair seems to indicate, rather, that it will not, irrespective of Berea's personal fate. But that does not prevent these measures from expressing beyond all doubt that ferial factors are pushing toward a softening of the dictatorship.
What are these factors and how far can they go? Get a sip of water here. Papa's thirsty. It would be a mistake to identify the Russian bureaucratic regime with the Stalinist police dictatorship. A system never to, is to be defined starting from its political regime. In theory, it is not inevitable that the stage of capitalism we call bureaucratic capitalism, in order to account for the novel character of its dominant stratum, be associated always and everywhere with a totalitarian policy of terror in the style of the one to which Stalin lent his name. We can even imagine that a total laborite victory in England, accompanied by complete nationalization of production and fully integrated planning, would not immediately and completely abolish, quote, democratic, end quote, English institutions, and quote, liberal, end quote, Moors. This hypothetical example, however, does not signify that a political regime can assume widely diverse forms in a bureaucratic system. The stratification of the economy and the concentration of political power accompanying it go hand in hand with the tendency to control all sectors of social life. And this bureaucratic mindset encourages the institution of strict discipline over individual behavior and thought. Up to what point does state control exercise and even require violence? This question does not mechanically depend upon economic structure, but also depends upon historical factors, origins of the bureaucracy, and the international situation, etc. In the case of the Russian bureaucracy, which came into existence by forging for itself its own economic bases, terror was a means of imposing class unity, uni utilizing the war of all against all to benefit the functioning of the whole. The Great Terror certainly had already come to an end before the last war with the final elimination of all political opponents and with the economic consolidation of the regime. But public life continued to be subjected to dictatorial arbitrariness, while the proletariat has crushed purely and simply under the burden of exploitation. The bureaucrats themselves, whatever their social position, did not obtain the kind of personal security that the consolidation of the economic system should have brought them. We may ask whether in the long run this situation has not become less and less compatible with the aspirations of the majority of the bureaucracy. It seems that the privileges the latter have won little by little, which allow an individual from birth onward to occupy a high-level place in society, thanks to the advantages enjoyed by his family, his inheritance, and the education he is sure to receive, were completely insufficient so long as the terror burdened each bureaucrat with the threat of being physically or socially eliminated. One second. It is logical, therefore, for the bureaucracy to exert pressure against its own higher-ups in order to obtain some guarantees concerning the personal fate of each bureaucrat and the power to enjoy his privileges and complete security. This assumes not only that bureaucracy has entered a new phase in its development, but that it is more and more conscious of it. First, privileges had to be cr created, completely built into society, and its position as dominant class had to be guaranteed on the social level against the country's other classes, the proletariat and the peasantry. Then it actually had to begin thinking of itself as a bureaucracy by divine right and to settle down comfortably in good in where the hell am I? In good conscience, in order to demand for itself an inviolable status, which meant that party ought to that the party ought to exist for the bureaucracy and not the bureaucracy for the party. On the other hand, that the very nature of the bureaucratic economy and society dictates a total centralization of power and necessarily tends to give it a totalitarian dictatorial character shows us a profound contradiction in this system of rule, analogous to the contradiction that leads to the ruination of parliamentary democracy in the final phase of monopoly capitalism.
But the struggle between those who socially embody the two poles of this contradiction is not necessarily resolved always and everywhere in the same fashion, and it is particularly clear that during the phase in which the centralizing pole has been extremely weakened by the death of the singular individual who for so long personified it, the internal struggles among his successors led them to make large concessions on this level, granting a caricature of habeas corpus to their liege men through the intermediary of articles in Pravda. But we can see a second factor at work in these measures as well as in the con in the recent concessions on the masses' standard of living, whether these concessions are apparent or real. This is the rule to attenuate the fundamental social contradiction of this system of rule, the workers' opposition to the regime. Russia's low labor productivity results from the workers' non-allegiance to a system of production that cheats them as well as from a miserable standard of living combined with terror. The resultant permanent economic crisis becomes much more serious as the technical and economic level of the country rises. Canals can be dug with concentration camp prisoners controlled by the whip as long as some of their skin is left on. Yeah, I think uh, that might be in reference to... Uh, what's it? The Baltic Canal? I'm not sure. But... Uh, there was a very big canal dug in the Soviet Union where, like, seriously, like, thousands of people of, like, forced laborers died in the process of making it. Um, it's kind of weird. There's this video on YouTube. Maybe I'll post it if I remember it when I'm uploading this thing. But there's a video on YouTube about, like, uh, there's, like, postcards about this canal and uh, about the... Uh, political ignorance and political cringeworthiness of the, uh, that postcard uh, in contemporary uh, Russia. It's, a, it's like a celebration of something that was like totally built by slave labor. It's, I don't know what, what comparable thing would be. But the guy compares it to like, it would be like if they had like a, I don't know, a canal built by enslaved, uh, by uh, con Jewish concentration camp workers in the Nazi era, uh, during the Holocaust, uh, they're something that they built being celebrated as a great uh, national treasure. Um, when it was really just like a, a suffering thrown at suffering thrown at suffering. Um, anyway, Canals can be dug with concentration camp prisoners controlled by the whip as long as some of their skin is left on, but modern industry requires that the worker maintain at least partial allegiance to allegiance to his job, and this allegiance cannot be obtained by terror pure and simple. To obtain it, he must be given some interest in the economic results of production. Under the pressure of worker struggles, American capitalism has been resolutely engaged upon this course for a long time. Though in the final analysis, this is not lessen the burden of the workers' alienation. We must think that Russian workers' opposition to production has become sufficiently strong so as to oblige the bureaucracy to initiate some specific concessions. Changes in the domestic field of Russian policy appear, therefore, as a response to the growing pressure of the regime's contradictions. We will see that this idea is singularly reinforced when we examine the changes that have occurred in the foreign policy of the USSR, in the policy of the satellite countries. All of, Russian's foreign, all of Russia's foreign policy gestures since Stalin's death have gone in the same direction. They have been designed to create the impression that the USSR no longer seeks to intensify the Cold War but wants to attenuate it. While Westerners fervishly excuse me, feverishly and confusedly have continued to seek an unobtainable policy, Moscow seems to be taking the initiative once again in its operations, acting simultaneously and in a concerted manner in all four corners of the earth, in Korea and in Germany, proclaiming its peaceful intentions and sending Soviet sailors to visit the Eiffel Tower. What is the meaning of this turnabout? It is simple... It is simply a question of, 
Is it simply a question of propagandistic or tactical maneuvers, or is it rather a reorientation of its long-term policy? If it is the latter, what are the causes of this reorientation, how far can it go, and what might its effects on the Western Bloc itself be? And finally, whether it is intended to accentuate the contradictions between America and its allies, or in any case ends up accentuating them, insofar as this turnabout inevitably has some effects on the strategy of the Western Bloc. A third question arises, how far can these contradictions develop, and what effect do these contradictions have on each other? Let us take up again our first question. What is the extent of the Russian reversal? We should point out, first of all, that it is limited. Despite its violent diplomacy, the USSR had not sought to unleash war. It now seems clear that the USSR did not count on an American counteroffensive when it began the Korean conflict. Since then, its line certainly has been to give nothing away, but it is also designed to preserve the status quo and nothing else. The systematic search for a compromise, therefore, is not a political about-face. True, the search for an armistice in Korea has led the Sino-Koreans to give in on a series of points that have, on the local scale, a certain importance. The methods for exchanging prisoners will allow them to get their hands back on only a small percentage of their formal troops. But for all that, the points are secondary when one considers the international context of this Stalinist initiative. In fact, this initiative is dangerous. The Korean operation has proved unprofitable. It required a costly military effort on China's part at a time when the latter should have been tackling the crucial problem of building an industrial infrastructure for itself and consolidating the new social regime. In any case, a Chinese military victory had become impossible and the pursuit of it, and the pursuit of it could only have led to a generalization of the war. In proposing peace, the Chinese and the Russians have nothing to lose right now. On the other hand, they sow confusion among their adversaries, divide the United Nations and South Korea, the United States and the English, and weaken the American war effort. By itself, therefore, the Korean turnabout would not be sufficient to prove a new policy of compromise. But we know that a whole series of diplomatic gestures are heading in the same direction. In Austria and in Germany, the nomination of civil commissioners and the lifting of the Iron Curtain, the renunciation of economic demands upon Turkey, the reestablishment of diplomatic ties with Yugoslavia, the proposal to renew commercial relations with Western Europe, to which it added a change in tone of Russian diplomacy. This new attitude has not been expressed till now by concrete measures. And to, to take an example, the refusal to resume negotiations on Austria on any other basis than those of Potsdam might make one think that the USSR was seeking more a detente than a settlement of European disputes. The new policy of the East Berlin government nevertheless has shed new light upon Russian tactics. The halt to the policy of collectivization and industrialization, quote, at all costs, end quote, the explicit recognition of the hostility of the population and its exodus to the West, the assurances given to the peasants and to the middle classes, the decision to reinstate the properties of those who had expropriated and those who had fled, and pure and simple capitulation to the evangelical church, which had been designated enemy number one, all these measures cannot be interpreted merely as tactical gestures. Far from that, the concessions we mention here are so important that they force us to ask ourselves about the motives behind Stalinist strategy. And in, what and in that case, we must recognize that the USSR is in the process of responding to an unprecedented crisis in its bloc, a crisis with many features, both social and economic, as revealed by recent events in Hungary, but especially in Germany and Czechoslovakia. The Hungarian, as we saw the date earlier, the Hungarian events haven't happened yet. Um, 1956. This is pre-1956. In these two 
countries, the local bureaucracy has proven incapable of securing its own power. The difficulty in both cases comes from the fact that Stalinism has run up against an advanced proletariat endowed with a tradition of struggle that knew how to digest quickly the experience of bureaucratic exploitation. The Czechoslovakian strikes, and especially the movements of Berlin and Magdeburg, have proved that the unification of the Eastern European Front is far from complete. It is likely, therefore, that the preoccupation with consolidating the dictatorship in these countries, and with building up at the same time an economy of the same type as that of the USSR, has been a decisive factor in the policy of Detente. In these regions, which are the most industrialized in Central Europe, the bureaucracy has not succeeded in liquidating proletarian resistance. The reduction in the standard of living, the extension of the workday, and the acceleration of work pace, the work pace appears as what they are, over-exploitation. To a proletariat that is one, not one step out of serfdom, but instead already has behind it a long history of resistance and struggle within the capitalist system. It is to this it must be added that this proletariat does not feel that it has been crushed by a revolutionary defeat as the Russian workers might have felt when the Stalinist dictatorship came crashing down upon them. Even though they did not oppose the instauration of popular democracy, and even though they supported it at the outset, the German and Czechoslovakian workers did not manufacture it themselves and they perceive much more clearly that it is foreign to them and that they are its victims. These factors have found their highest expression in East Germany during the June days. Faced with those, these growing difficulties on the home front, and wanting at the same time to create the most favorable impact upon West Germany, the Stalinists have taken a series of measures to promote detente as early as May. What appears most striking in these measures is a thoroughly anti-working class character of the bureaucratic regime. Indeed, these detente measures were addressed to all the strata of the population, peasants, shopkeepers, refugees, the bourgeoisie, priests, all social categories except one, the workers. They had not been forgotten, for it was, it was they who would have to cover the costs of the operation to compensate the bureaucracy for what it otherwise would have lost by making concessions to other strata of the population. The production plan had been revised in a way that increased the production of consumer goods at the expense of the, product, the production of equipment. At the same time, however, production norms were, quote, voluntarily, end quote, increased by 10%, which amounted, in fact, to a much larger reduction in wages. We know very well that the working class manifested its manifested its reaction. The partial strikes of June 15th and 16th were transformed on June 17th into a powerful revolt embracing most of the great industrial centers of East Germany. In East Berlin, the demonstrators took over the streets of the morning of June 17th. In other towns, they even seized governmental buildings. Elsewhere, we will provide a more thorough study of the origins of the movement and its consequences. Let us mention what here the most important points that emerge from these events. One, without the intervention of the Russian army, it is likely that the German Stalinist government would have been overthrown. Its own leadership was dislocated, demoralized, and unable to act. Its own police force either had abandoned it or was lying low. The Russian tanks did not have to do battle, for their mere arrival was a reminder that until further notice, East Germany is part of the Russian Empire. Except for the likely repercussions of a working class revolt within the Russian army, this fact shows both the indestructible power of the proletariat and the limitations on potential movements. So long as the system of exploitation remains secure at the world's two opposing poles, the Soviet Union and the United States. Two, the experience of Stalinist bureaucratism as merely a new form of exploitation is an established fact for the industrial proletariat of the satellite countries. Through a number of signs, the workers' opposition to the bureaucratic regimes of the satellite countries was already well known, but now the two terms of this opposition have been made clearly distinct. 
Three, the concession that the East German Stalinist bureaucracy has been obliged to undertake in order to forestall events in Hungary and Czechoslovakia contain a fundamental lesson of the workers, excuse me, for the workers of these countries. Resistance and struggle pay off. We cannot insist too strongly on the literally revolutionary significance of this conclusion, which the workers of these countries already have drawn and which is about, without doubt, in the process of spreading throughout the entire Soviet glasses. Um, I don't know what, in what order I've uploaded these videos, but the glasses is a common term at this time for the entire of Eastern Europe that's occupied by the Soviet uh, Union or Soviet Army. And yet, if working class opposition succeeds in expressing itself and putting the stability of a new regime in peril here and there, it is also because the leadership strata are not unified and because they have come up against considerable difficulties in erecting or consolidating their economic structure. These difficulties already existed due to the mere fact that the requirements of accumulation involve sacrifices on the part of all strata of the population and that the USSR cannot meet all the investment demands coming in simultaneously from China, Romania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, etc. But they also have added to by they also have been added to by the policy of the USSR, which, after a period of outright pillaging in Europe, never has attempted to share the burden of industrialization. On the contrary, it has always accorded itself substantial advantages in its dealings with its satellites. If one part of the bureaucratic leadership is so strongly tied to the USSR that it can do nothing but enforce its policy no matter what the circumstances, another part at least, and in particular the largest strata on which it relies, cannot help but be sensitive to the USSR's privileges and can accept the sacrifices imposed on their countries only grudgingly. The open scission with Tito and the various oppositions that have been punished with purges and, a spectac and spectacular trials reveal the battle going on within the national bureaucracies, a battle that probably has not ended. Finally, the proximity of the Western army and the prospect of a war that might challenge the present regimes and reestablish the status quo ante have fed the hope and resistance of the middle class people remaining in these countries who have not yet forgot their old privileges. All these factors which conspire to make the European satellites particularly vulnerable elements of the Russian defense system suffice to make it clear why it would be advantageous to have a period of respite capable of leading to a reestablishment of authority. And the persistence with which the Eastern diplomacy is seeking trade with Western Europe, whatever might be the tactical value of these postures in relation to the contradictions that exist within the Western bloc, confirms that the USSR is desirous of easing its immediate economic difficulties. Our intention, as we have said already, is not to indulge in unverifiable conjectures. We cannot estimate at the present time the extent of the contradictions in the Russian bloc, and calculate, as a consequence, how far the USSR might go under their impetus. Let us be content to note that some of these contradictions cannot be overcome absolutely, and that the response has begun to provide them, and it has begun to provide for them, excuse me, let us be content to note that some of these contradictions cannot be overcome absolutely, and that the response it has begun to provide for them can exacerbate them. The most interesting example is the turnabout affected in Germany. Its consequences already are highly significant, and if it continues, they will become even more so. In this case, we have seen both a working class revolt and the collapse of the CP. These two events, which obviously are connected, are to a certain extent an initial response to the Kremlin's new policy. And this initial response already is upsetting the givens upon which this new policy was based. America and the Contradictions of the Western Bloc It would be artificial to try to describe the R Russian policy and the difficulties to which it is responding and which it encounters without speaking of their relation to Western policy. What is remarkable till now is the extreme confusion found in U.S. policy.
This confusion has only been reinforced by the new Russian initiatives. Indeed, it has been perceptible for several years now, and independent of the latest internal national events, it corresponds to a crisis in the whole of American society. The boom in the forces of production and in technical development, and the disorder in the struggle between monopolies, the anxiousness about organizing the allied bloc strategically, and the blindness of its position of economic dominance that destroys the cohesiveness of this bloc, the will to make war against the USSR, and the retreat before the concomitant financial costs. The divvying up of state power between military industrial clans who achieve predominance by turns, the extreme corruption of office holders and government functionaries, and the hysteria of large sections of the petty bourgeoisie who have replaced the lynching of Negroes with the struggle against communism together make of American society. In the absence of a political expression of the proletariat, a broken down imperialist power that still has found neither the conditions nor the means to produce a policy. Confining, confining ourselves to the last few months, it is only too easy to emphasize the disarray that the USSR's peace offensive has provoked. Eisenhower's speech last April, described as historic by all the Western press, is, as hastily drawn up, is a hastily drawn up propaganda tract that merely responds to the concern that nothing, to, that nothing be said that implies either peace or war. And yet, at the same time, he finds himself partly contradicted, partially contradicted by John Foster Dulles's threatening statements, while Le Monde per periodically announces that the President General is taking the reins of power back into his own hands, all his gestures reveal his weakness. He puts the pressure on for the military credits vote, but that does not keep them from being partially reduced. He proclaims his loyalty to the European alliance, but names Radford in the place of Bradley. While responding to Taft, he shows that he is concerned above all with handling him with kid gloves, and he reaffirms his opposition to China's admission to the United States. He opens up the possibility of a four-power conference after the Bermuda meeting, but again lets Dulles rule this conference out by setting conditions that in fact render it impossible. Finally, after having warned youth against the inquisitional methods some people are trying to introduce in the United States, he makes special care to say, excuse me, he takes special care to say that his speech was not aimed at McCarthy and he refuses to pardon the Rosenbergs. In the absence of a concerted policy on the part of its government, the United States nevertheless has a strong reaction on the economic level and will have an even stronger reaction in the, if the Russian policy of detente is borne out. The beginning of the recession, reported in the last issue of Socialisme ou Barbary, could have dangerous consequences and could grow and dislocate the Western economy. Everything depends on whether such a situation would promote a return to a New Deal type of policy or the rise of a McCarthyite fascism as seems more likely. In the latter case, however, it is doubtful whether aggressive U.S. policy will bring the majority of the Western camp in its wake so much as it will signify a slowdown or a discontinuation of credits for Europe. Nevertheless, the United States' ability to maintain relative cohesion in the Western bloc does not depend on its internal economic and political development alone, but also on that of the Eastern bloc on the latter's capacity to overcome its difficulties in part and to interest Western Europe in international detente and in commercial exchanges. At present, the clearest thing is that the United States comfortably settled into its Cold War and at the same time feeling incapable of developing it into a successful hot war is not interested in detente. The English and the French, in contrast, do have an interest in detente. The entire difficulty there, however, stems from the fact that it is impossible for them to make policy independent of the United States, though pure and simple dependence in the long run would be disastrous. The English reaction to the Russian reversal is dictated by this double requirement, at the same time to keep its distance from the United States, pushing for detente, and yet not to provoke any scission with the latter since the situation does not allow for the existence of a third international force. 
On the economic level, England is very desirous of resuming economic links with the East, and it keeps violating American trade restrictions, as the celebrated affair of the English delivering goods to China has shown. If the Battle Act were discontinued or eased up, such commerce might permit the exportation of raw materials, machine tools, and certain manufactured products for which the Eastern Bloc has the greatest need. We must not exaggerate its importance, however. The Geneva Conference's allowance for East-West trade were, made, were very modest, 3% of world commerce. Even if these exchanges were enlarged, they could not reach pre-war levels because the structure of Eastern European countries has been modified and Westerners no longer can count on receiving massive exports of grains at low prices. The domestic market now absorbing a much larger proportion of the ag of agricultural produce than before. The pursuit of trade with the East, therefore, is not an end in itself for the English. It is also a means of putting pressure on the Americans, whose ruthless protectionism the English are less and less willing to put up with. The aggressive tone of Butler, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, recently has shown that the English will not hesitate to resort to a certain amount to a certain amount of extortion in order to force the Americans to ease up on their economic policy. Economic blackmail is much easier to conduct when it's, it supports the political interests of Great Britain, which does not want war at any price, conscious as it is that it then would be in danger of losing for good its rank as a great power. While England, unlike the United States, has a bourgeois conscious bourgeoisie, excuse me, while England, unlike the United States, has a bourgeoisie conscious of its interests and a government with a political line, the objective situation hems it in with difficulties it cannot master. The danger of an economic crisis in the United States directly affects it too. As was seen at the beginning of the Russian turnabout, the London Stock Exchange remains particularly sensitive to the threat of detente. In 1938, a 4% drop in American production brought about a 41% fall in English exports and a 50% fall in the trading of the sterling area with the dollar area. Although economic interdependence between the two powers has been considerably reduced, it still is substantial enough for the downturn in the United States to have appreciable repercussions in Great Britain. Whatever England's interest in detente, we must note that on this point, Intercapitalist contradictions still make a coherent strategy difficult to achieve and autonomous activity impossible. What is true for England is truer for France, which is even more interested in seeing that the Cold War does not develop into open conflict and yet is extremely dependent upon the United States. We need only note that French capitalism suffers its contradictions from one day to the next without trying to overcome them or even to transpose them into a coherent political language. The persistence of inflation, growing unemployment, and the worsening of the Indochina conflict have led to a total crisis for the regime. This is expressed in concrete terms by the fact that it has been impossible to form a government. The Russian turnabout has had some repercussions on the French bourgeoisie, as testified by the Mendez Francais, Mendez Francis bid for power, which would have been unthinkable in a different international climate. Where excuse me, were this bid to be taken up again, when circumstances would allow it, it would not signify that the possibilities of a third force have grown appreciably larger. There is no need for us to note that the English did not rel relish the, con the idea of a Mendez government and that the conservatives openly condemned it, seeing it as a leftist bevanism. The reproachment of the French with England runs up against the latter's traditionally isolationist policy toward Europe. Contradictions in the Western Bloc, contradictions in the Eastern Bloc, the inability of each to take full advantage of the other's difficulties because of its own difficulties, and the proletariat, a force whose actions neither system can predict, but one which, when it enters into the scene, onto the scene, upsets all the schemes of the exploiters, just as the characteristics Excuse me. Such are the characteristics of the situation that we had tried to bring about. Excuse me. That we have tried to bring out. This situation is not entirely new. We do not think any more today than yesterday that a comprehensive settlement of east-west conflicts might be in the offing. Russia does not have free reign with the German bureaucracy, 
any more than the United States does with Syngman Ri. And for both adversaries, a genuine compromise would only make their domestic problems even worse. We do not believe any more today than yesterday that the proletariat is completely dominated on an international scale. And yet the last few months have taught us that the development of contradictions in the two blocs may not be leading toward war as quickly as we had thought. We have learned that the proletariat can benefit from these contradictions and, before the war starts, begin to join together again upon autonomous bases.